Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. She has something like 3,000 items. She bought one dress from Marilyn Monroe for $1,000, and they're already assessing it at $2 million. Now, forget about all of that stuff. It's what people will pay for, and then who would own it? I'm thinking about a a pair of shoes, stinky, worn-out, crummy-looking shoes that was auctioned for $7,000. The reason being because of the person who owned it, Michael Jordan. I put my shoes out at a garage sale. I can't even get 50 cents for those things. <laughs> Nobody cares who had those shoes before, but they, they're Michael Jordan. They'd have it. And you're wondering, where am I going with this? Those of you that are pretty much in tune, you'll know where I'm going with it. First of all, how much are you worth is based upon how much you were paid for. And when you think about it, who bought you? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. But what did he pay to buy you? He had to go to this cross, die a humiliating death, in front of everybody, did not deserve any of that, not even a portion of all of that. Then he goes to this cross, horribly pained. Then he dies on this cross to give to you eternal life. And that's God himself in the person of Christ doing that for you. So think about what it cost him. It cost God the death of his only son. It cost Christ his own death. It cost the Holy Spirit his involvement in your life to convict you and to bring you to Christ. There was an incredible eternal investment in you so that you would have eternal life. You have value. But then think about again what I just said. Who owns you right now? The Bible does say it was his blood who bought you, but that's true. But it's also true that you've been bought with a price and now you belong to the Lord. And can you imagine what that means to know that the Lord owns you? The value that you have in Christ? So it doesn't matter how many valuables you have it does matter how valuable you are. It's who you are and whose you are because of Christ. You notice how everything is pointing back to the person and the work of Christ. But it's until we finally rest in that and be satisfied with it, we will continue to fight this inner feeling of wanting self-worth, needing to be accepted, playing the games of the world to get it all, instead of just resting in the fact that God loves me just the way that I am. I was doing a study on the internet of seeing how much people will pay for ransom when someone gets um, kidnapped. Oddly enough, I was surprised. I thought it'd be in the gazillions of dollars, you know, that kind of thing. I found that the average of all the kidnappings that they were able to uh, do their study with over the last few years, you know what the average amount that people paid when a person was kidnapped in their family? This is odd. Only $62,000. Now, that's an average, so some may have paid more, some maybe didn't pay anything, you know, to let them go. I don't know. The ship that was pirated by the Somalian pirates, the most expensive ransom that was paid for a ship was only $6 million. But now, you hear all these numbers and all of that, but let's just say for a moment that we go on a mission trip to X country in this world, and while we were there, you and your family are with us on this trip, and one of your children, doesn't matter, was kidnapped. What would you do? How much would you pay to get your child back? That'd be a conversation to have over lunch, huh? I think we'd pay anything and everything. In fact, we would do this. We'd say, I'll give you everything and I will give you me, kidnapper, if you release my family member. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Who you are and whose you are ought to really elevate you to the point that I don't care what struggles we go through in this world, nothing can compare to what he did so I could be in his forever family and I celebrate the goodness of the Lord. How special that is. Well, in this passage, we're talking about a living stone. That's an interesting term, that living stone, isn't it? You know, living stone. How many of you remember, this will date me, I know. How many remember when they were selling pet rocks? Anybody remember? How many bought a pet rock? Don't raise your hand, okay? I don't want to embarrass anybody here. But a pet rock, you know, they had it all decorated up and the kids had talked to it and they would pet, they had a little menagerie of pet rocks in their windowsills, you know, all that kind of stuff, the pet rock. It's really nothing. But I can tell you this, that God, through Christ, is involved in a building program. That's right. 
He's in the building program. He says, first of all, I'll be the foundation, I'll be the cornerstone, but I'm in a building program and I need different stones to make this building work because I'm going to build it as big as I want it to be. And he says, although I'm the foundation and I'm the cornerstone, you are the other stones that's building this up. Now he's talking about the universal church, the church at large. But he does that through believers that are in local churches. And so I'm a part of that living stone experience with the Lord. I'm important. I'm a part of something that he is really building. I hope that you understand that while they still rejected him, they'll reject us. But we can be a part of this forever building that he's having for all of us. I hope that would cause us to to celebrate who we are because of who we are in Christ. Let me go to the third point. I'm chosen. I'm valuable. And now I'm gifted and capable to handle any challenge that comes into my life. I'm gifted and capable. Now I say that underneath the umbrella of the passage here in verse 9 that says, you are a chosen race. Now if you will for a moment, you might want to underline that word chosen because that goes again back to my first point, that you are chosen, you're precious, and you're acceptable. But now he defines that by saying, what is a chosen race? You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Now, that's a great term, but when you hear the word priesthood, some of you are going back in your mind and you're trying to define, if I'm part of the priesthood, does that mean I have to wear special, you know, outfits and and, and stuff on my head and have to go through a particular seminary and, and give up having marriage and those kinds of things? Some of you just have all those thoughts of it. And what you need to do is don't look at the way religion has painted the picture of a priest, but go back to the Old Testament and how God painted the picture of a priest because those are real people in the Bible. I want to reduce all that he says about priests in the Old Testament down to two primary things that the priest would do. One of the things that the priest would do is that they would have what we would call direct access to God. They could bring the people to God. So they had a connection to God. The second thing that the priest had was that they were able to represent then God to the people. And so when the law was given, when the word was given, and it was now given to Moses, etc., that word was to go out through the teaching of the priest, to the fathers, to the people. And so they had a responsibility. Now, where am I going with that with you all? And that is because you've trusted Christ as your Savior. That meant you that you are a part of the royal priesthood. You're a part of that chosen nation. That you become that special holy calling that God has for you. Which means simply this. Just like the priest, two things. One, you have immediate direct access to God. I appreciate when you put your little prayer request at the bottom of our communication cards. I pray for it. Our team often prays for it on Tuesday mornings. Some of you will share it in our wonderful midweek prayer sessions. Some of you will call me, email me. Would I pray for this? That's really great, and I will. But remember, it's not you give me your request. You don't pray. I'm closer to God. I'll talk to him for you so you can get your prayer request answered. No, I'm just another person just like you. You have immediate access to the Lord. The reason you might have me pray for you would be more to pray with you on this matter so that our hearts can be knit together in love for one another and I can share and bear your burden with you so that together we can take it to the Lord. And when God does answer it, we both can celebrate it. It's not all about you celebrating it all alone. So we can do it together. So you are a priest. In fact, I should be giving you my prayer request and have you pray for my needs. And together we're going to the Lord because we're all a part of his royal priesthood. But there's something else too. We also then will bring the knowledge of God through the word to other people and tell them how they too can have eternal life and to grow and be a part of it. The Latin word for the word priest is an unusual word. I didn't say Greek now, New Testament Greek, Old Testament Hebrew for the most part. The Latin word actually means a bridge. I like that term in the Latin because we really are a bridge. We take people to the Lord. We bring the Lord to those people. But you now, as a priest, would be a bridge. You can take others to the Lord and you can bring the Lord to those people as well. What a privilege it is to be a part of it. I want you to look at another verse, if you don't mind. This is a verse that's also found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. It's there in your notes. Look at it, if you will. It says... Who saved us in the context is referring to God now. God saved us and called us to a holy calling. Would you circle that phrase, holy calling? Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. In other words, God has purpose for my life and there's grace to be bestowed, which he gave us in Christ before the ages began. 
That means that now, as part of his priesthood, I get a chance to be a minister in other people's lives. Do you know that when you trusted Christ as Savior, you received eternal life, you received the Holy Spirit, and you received a spiritual gift, and the purpose of that gift was so that you could come alongside other people to help build them up, to grow the church, as well as to bring glory to the Lord through that gift. So as a priest now, you can then go out and minister to other people. That's why we have such seminars around here called Discover Your Divine Design. So you can discover the gift that God has given to you when you trusted Christ, part of his royal priesthood, how to minister to others. That's why we have these dream teams to help equip you in leadership and how that you can minister better to one another by being up on information and ministry opportunities as well. That phrase, holy calling, in a couple translations actually refers to a holy life. Another translator talks about a holy work. And frankly, I think they both go together. I think it's a holy life doing holy service for a holy God. So it's all about holiness, our relationship with him, and reaching out to other people. Again, the priest, helping people come to know the Lord and bringing the greatness of the Lord to other people through his word. How important that is. Look, if you will, at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 5, 7, and 27. How do I know what ministry I'm supposed to have? It says here, there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In other words, God has given you all that's necessary for common good. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You're part of God's body, and he has a wonderful work for you. Now, if I can stay in context for a moment, I'd like you to look here at verse 9. It says this, part of the greatest responsibility in this context of being a priest is so that we would share the message of salvation with others. Here's what it says. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let me come back to the self-esteem issue right here. Track with me, if you will, for a moment. Jim Dobson, in one of his earlier books, he did this big survey on women. And he found out that probably the greatest challenge that women face, and this was 10,000 women that he surveyed, the number one challenge that they faced was this, a low self-esteem. And so I would like you to know that for you ladies for a moment, I would like you to take this message and I'd like you to really own it. Because if it's true that women do struggle a little bit more with self-esteem, and I'm not going to try to unpack why and who and how much and all of that, I'd rather unpack, hey, you got it, you struggle with it, you kind of realize you do, but now there is hope for you in victory in Christ. Take this and really know You're chosen, you're valuable, and you have gifts that God has given to you. Now, with that in mind, you men come alongside them, and perhaps what you might do is to help them with their low self-esteem or their challenged self-esteem, and you begin to show them how God has made them such wonderful people from the inside out. Let's go back to this ministry part because it's all connected together. I often find that when God has now wired you in a special way, because you're now His, is who you are and whose you are. If you discover the way you've been made... And now you go into ministry of some type. I don't mean you have to be a full-time preacher somewhere. But whatever it is, you begin to serve in that area of your giftedness. You're going to find yourself living a life in your sweet spot of life with so much fulfillment. So what you might want to do is to begin finding a way that you can begin to add value to other people, specifically through ministries. Now, you could do this by just getting involved in any ministry that's out there. Just help people anywhere you can. Or what you could do is be more strategic. And what you can do is find a faith family, very much like ours, that is helping you discover your gift and then giving you outlets where in the body that you can use it for coaching and help and affirmation. And when you're serving in that area, you're getting involved, there is that, wow, I really am needed. I really do have something of value to add to other people. And it's not you getting the praise, it's God made you because it's who you are and whose you are, so all the praise goes back up to Him. So maybe if you are struggling with a self-esteem issue, it could be that you are saved, you're grateful that you don't have a hell to look forward to, that you know you're going to heaven, but you're really not serving the Lord. And so you have this low-grade infection of guilt because you know you should be serving. You know you should be active in a ministry. You know you should be using what God has given you to help other people to know who they are and whose they are. So you might look for that and say, Lord, help me to be able to discover where I should serve in that particular area. Remember, it was Paul who said all of that. 
Get involved in ministry because of who you are. Let me give you the last point now. We talked about that we happen to be chosen, that we're valuable, that we've been gifted, but I want to end with we're also forgivable. Some of you might be looking over your life now and you're saying, you know, Pastor, um, you're talking about my self-esteem, but the reason my self-esteem is so low is not just because of what others said about me or said to me. My self-awareness, my self-worth is down because I have been a real jerk. (laughs) I have done things that are wrong. I've had bitterness in my life. I've had moral impurity in my life. Greed has taken over my life and I have behind me a trail of broken relationships and bodies. I have things in my past that I hope will never come out. In fact, I have been so hamstrung by my life that I could never get involved in ministry because I have no reputation. I have nothing that would really add value to other people. And if they knew, I'd be so embarrassed, I'd be run out of the church. Well, I don't know what you have in your life, but I want you to know on the authority of God's word that everybody is forgivable. When Jesus died, he didn't just die for the sins of the good people and their little light sins. He paid for all sins, and one religion calls them mortal sins and venial sins. One is a sin that you'll never get forgiveness from. The other is a sin that, yeah, you might get some forgiveness. You've got to go to a middle ground when you die. You have to pay some money here on this or maybe hope to get out of it. I know they mean well, but the problem is it is not biblical even in their own Bibles. So going back to this now, I want you to know when Jesus died, he paid for all sins. So whatever you've done in your past life, you are forgivable by God. Do you believe that? Look at the verse, the last verse of our passage here. It says, once you were not a people. That's right, you were lost, you're aimless, you're outside of Christ. You might have had some ethnic background, all of that in context to be a Gentile. But now you are God's people. Underline it, you are God's people. Not a cult, not a religion, not a denomination. Don't worry about denominations. It's just a tag. When you go up, it'll blow off. And if you don't go to heaven, it'll burn off. But let's get back to this. You are God's people. Then it says, once you had not received mercy. I remember when I was 15, if I died, I'd have gone straight to hell because I didn't trust Christ as my Savior. Then Carol brought me the message that I'm saved by grace. And it says, but now you have received mercy. And that should be in bold print on your sheet there. Underline that. That means you are forgivable with the Lord. You've received mercy. Some of you have such a picture of God that you think God is always after you. It's kind of like the guy who went to the beach surfing and had a surfboard on top of his car and he's heading down to the beach. He didn't tie it down well enough so his board blew off and broke apart behind him. When he pulled over, a police car came over there and gave him a ticket because he didn't properly strap down his board. He goes a little while over the poly. He's coming down the poly too fast. Another policeman pulls him over, gives him a ticket. Finally rounds the corner into the beach and he runs into another car. And he says, man, a broken board, a ticket here and a ticket there, a smashed up car here. He now beats his head on his steering wheel. And he says, God, what is wrong? Why is this happening to me? And he hears a voice that simply says, some people just tick me off. And maybe you right now feel like God just ticks you off or you tick God off. I don't know what you've got in your past, but I want you to know that God says, I love you. Yes, we were enemies. Yes, you're under my condemnation. Yes, you'd spend eternity separated from me. But he says, I'm going to take and put all that aside through the work of my son. My spirit is now drawing you. If you'll place your faith in Jesus Christ, he says, no longer will you be condemned. You'll have forever eternal life. You are valuable. You are chosen. I have gifted you to face whatever you've got to face in life. Because you're forgivable through my son. You know, we talked about being accepted in the beloved one. Do you know that there's also another verse in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 that says this, not only may I accept it into him, it says Christ in me, the hope of glory. Now we can talk about those four. Chosen, valuable, gifted, forgivable. But there's one other that makes it important to know who you are and whose you are is this. Christ himself says, you are so important to me, I'm going to come and I'm going to live inside of you. Can you imagine now that not only am I accepted into his family, but I'm a partaker of his divine nature and he's in me right now. Now the question is, because he's in me, does he feel at home in me? I can have him in me because he's in me. Once I trust Christ, never get out of me. But at the same time, is he at home in my heart? Am I satisfied with his presence? 
Has he taken up complete residence in every area of my life so I can enjoy who I am because whose I am? With the Lord, he says, I've chosen you. You're special. And I accept you. He says, you are valuable. I made you. He says that you have a gift and capable to do what I ask you to do. And he also says that you're forgivable. With all of that, he says, you belong to me and I want to live inside of you. Will you let me do that? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and give you an opportunity for you to maybe for the first time say, Lord, I want to thank you for allowing me to be in your forever family by faith alone. So maybe your prayer to the Lord might be something like this. Lord, I have really allowed the world and the world's values to try to direct my life and I know that I am really empty on the inside. I, I, I'm surviving on this earth, but I'm not thriving. But I know that you want me to. And I know you want to give me the very best. And so, Lord, I come to you now admitting that I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. I'm admitting to you that because I've sinned my nature and choice that I'm separated from you for all eternity. I know that I have to be perfect to go to heaven, but I'll never be perfect, and you knew that. And so you pointed me to Christ who died and rose again. And so, Lord, I believe that Jesus is the Lord and that he did die on the cross and he is bestowing on me grace and mercy. And I'm going to receive him by faith. And so, Lord, I want to thank you that going to heaven is not by works of righteousness, but it's by believing in you and you alone. And so, Lord, I am now transferring my faith and placing it all on you. And so, Lord, I want to thank you that I could know I have eternal life. I want to thank you that, Father, that you have put me into your family. I'm accepted into you. And that because of you, I'm valuable. And that because of you, you have given me gifts and abilities to do what you want me to do. And that, Lord, because of what Christ has done for me on the cross, that shows that I am forgivable, not based on anything that I have done, but on your great mercy. And so, Lord... I want to thank you for coming to live in me now and for me to have a relationship with you. Is there anyone in here that would say by an uplifted hand that that's the kind of prayer you're praying now, that you're trusting Christ to be your forever Savior, and now you know who you are and you know whose you are, and you'd like for me to pray for you. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if today is the day you're trusting Christ, would you slip up your hand? And put it down so I could pray for you. I won't have you come forward. Is there anyone at all? Thank you. All right, for the Christians that are here, maybe some of you need to look at yourself now through the eyes of the Lord. Yes, we're sinners. There's no good deed in ourselves that we could ever do. We're miserable and lost. But because we've trusted Christ as Savior, we are now part of His forever family. And He is not only our Savior, but our Lord. And we want the Lord to feel at home inside of us, not just come into us, and seal us, but also to abide in us. Dr. Charles Cooley, who was the dean of American sociologists, I don't believe he was a believer, he did say this though. He said, your self-esteem, your self-worth or image is determined to a large degree by what you think the people or the person that matters most to you thinks about you. And so if there's a person in your life that means so much to you, you might be reflecting how they look at you to determine who you are. And God says, I want you to look to me and what I think of you to determine how you should see yourself. So put your eyes on the Lord right now as a Christian and say, Lord, thank you that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. And I have purpose and I'm going to live it for you. Is there anyone in here today that needed this message to turn your eyes back on the Lord again to remind you of who you are and whose you are? And you'd like for me to pray for you. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you how that clearly you have revealed so much about ourselves in Scripture. And while we do see ourselves alienated from the commonwealth and separated from you and without you, that we can be drawn up close to you because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. And Father, that we would not only allow that to bring us into your forever family and so we don't go to hell and we have eternal life, but we would allow that to define us because now we know who we are in Christ and whose we are because of Christ. And we worship you for that. 
In Jesus' name, amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.